Howdy. How y'all doing? Doing well. Good, good. Everybody, this is Austin. Um, Hello, Austin. Austin is our friends, Travis and Robert. Hey, Travis. Hey, Robert. Good. That's a lot of books. Yeah, we're in my office right now. Yeah. I wish I could say I've read them all, though. That's just for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Robert, Robert has this fake stack of oh. books to pretend like he's read lots of books too. This little minuscule, <laughs> he usually props it up and on, yeah. his, on his background, he'll duplicate it to make it look like he's read more books. Well, that's than a good he strategy. Has. Yeah. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, um, Travis and Robert, they're members of our church. So they are a fair bit more knowledgeable about the topics that we were talking about when we last saw you. So they should be able to answer your questions maybe a little bit a little bit better than we could. That's why they're here. Yeah, sounds good. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys taking time to meet with me. Um, no, yeah. no. Anytime they tell somebody has questions or concerns, we we love to try to help out. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, well, yeah. I, I, first, I'd just like to... Well, I'm Austin. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Um, Married to Katie, got our first little baby on the way any day now. Um, so I think I'm labeled as Baptist pastor, but yeah, I'm, a, I'm the college pastor over here at Ridgecrest Baptist Church in Springfield. Um, yeah, I'd love to, well, first, I'd, yeah, I'd just love to hear a little bit more about like who you guys are and, uh, you know, how you came to the uh, LDS faith and yeah. Well, my name's Travis and I, I was just born a member. So born and raised LDS? Yep. Robert, same for you? Uh, No, I was uh, born and raised a Catholic, and while in Catholic seminary, I actually converted. In Catholic seminary? Yeah. Wow. What was that like? Uh, It was pretty interesting. They still let me have my degrees, so it's okay. That's good. (laughs) But probably not confirmed Catholic now. Um, well, if you know anything about sacramental theology, I'm still a Catholic, um, so, but yeah, that's yeah. it. Neat. Um, so how about yourself? How did, how did you, oh, how sorry. did you become uh, a Protestant? Yeah, um, I was not raised as a Christian. Um, I was raised in Nashville, Tennessee area. Um, I, I call it Southern Churchianity, um, where, you know, we were, um, we were familiar with somebody named Jesus. Um, we read the nativity scene at Christmas Eve, but outside of that, um, we only, we stopped going to church by the time I was in second grade. I don't really remember much of that. And, uh, you know, my, my parents never really practiced faith, nor my grandparents, um, never saw them praying, reading scripture. They didn't really ask me about any of that. Um, as I got into high school, my uh, friends or, you know, middle school, high school, my friends started, you know, being involved in youth group activities, things like that, a lot of fun events, and they started to invite me to things. And so um, when I was a, uh, when I was 16, uh, in between sophomore and junior year of high school, uh, my friends invited me to a camp called Centrifuge. And uh, so I went with the mentality of uh, eating French fries, playing basketball and meeting girls. And uh, while there, I just, as I was in worship service one night, just hanging out with everybody and, you know, music playing and people singing, praising God, I just looked around and realized, you know, these people had something that I didn't have. You know, these people had an authentic relationship with God, whereas I just kind of was, oh, I am a good kid. I, you know, don't cuss, I don't drink, don't have sex, you know. Um, and it, I realized that being a Christian meant more than just, you know, following a list of rules. And so, um, I gave my life to Jesus and said, uh, you know, whatever you've got plans, I'm trusting in you for my salvation. I'm trusting in you for your plans for my life. And, uh, ever since then I've been walking with him and following him and learning more about what that means. Oh, so what has you interested in the LDS faith? Well, so when I was in undergrad, um, I majored in psychology, minored in philosophy. So yeah, I just, I love 
honestly, just this uh, kind of comparative religion component of things of like, I love learning um, and thinking critically about why do we believe the things that we believe. So as I was in college, you know, I had these kind of crisis of faith moments, like, man, what if everything I believe is a lie? And so really wanted to learn more about different faiths and You know, one of, um, I, I've interacted with a lot of LDS uh, members over the years and, you know, had a lot of interesting conversations. And so I always want to um, think critically and consider other people's positions. You know, I don't want to assume that I'm right. Um, I want to make sure that I'm, you know, learning more and thinking and hearing honestly from those other people and what they believe and see if that might be something that makes more sense than what I think. Oh, cool. So you have, did you have any questions for us specifically about? Yeah, you know, I, I think probably, and again, I, I've, I've talked to a lot of LDS people over the years, but I've talked to gotten a kind of range of answers uh, on some things, but I'd be curious, you know, one thing that I think I've encountered in recent years that is have kind you, of, just just real quick, have you ever have you ever read the Book of Mormon? Yeah, I got one right here. But, so but have you read a, it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I've read it cover to cover, but yeah. You know, about about how many how, how much of it do you think you've read? Oh gosh, I couldn't even begin to give you an approximation. Like just the Book of Mormon or Doctrine and Covenants, all of it? No, just the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is about 500 pages. About how many pages do you think you've read? And I don't know. It could be anywhere from 10 to 50, not just reading straight from, but also um, quotations and, you know, Mormon doctrine from like McCon McConkie. Is that his name? Bruce R. McConkie. Yes. Yeah. Reading stuff like passages from him, that kind of thing. So okay. I, I, yeah, I don't want to mislead you. I don't think I've read it cover to cover. Okay. But um, yeah, I'd be curious, like in, in your opinion, is the LDS church a Christian church? Yes, we would claim that we're the only true and living Christian church. We're the only true and living church on the face of the earth. Now, of course, that begs the question, like how do you define Christian? And that can be either a very generic sense or a very specific sense. As yeah, I'm sure so you Christian. Were. But, yeah, yeah, so ahead, Christian. Thomas. Yeah, so in the general sense, yes, but typically when people ask us if we consider ourselves Christians, most Latter-day Saints would say yes, as Robert did, and that would be our, our understanding of it. But typically, I mean, if you're looking at Christian as a word with a, de with a definition and meaning, the definitions in the dictionary are incredibly broad. So people yeah. who accept and follow the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Christ without any specific identifiers as to what that means are considered Christians. But in the sense that most people who question us being Christian mean it, because the way that they're defining it, it requires certain baggage or criteria. And if you don't believe these specific things, you're not a Christian. So if that's mm -hmm. how they're defining it, then, and that's what Christian means, then, then no, we wouldn't be Christians in that sense. But in the sense that we believe we're the true followers of Jesus Christ, yes, we're Christians. So maybe a better way to ask, or not a better way, like a kind of follow-up question would be like, take the Methodist church. Like, is the Methodist church a Christian church? Again, in the, in the general sense that Christian means somebody who follows Jesus Christ, yes. Okay. So... So your answers to me indicate like kind of two things. Like you're saying like, yeah, we have some shared understanding of Jesus of Nazareth and following him. But Robert, your, your answer uh, was very specific on, yes, but we're the only one in true Christian church. Yeah. So what, what for you is the differentiation of what does it mean to be the only one in true Christian church, whereas the Catholic, the Protestant, you know, is not? Um, yeah, sure. Like, because they're pretty broad traditions, you want to focus specifically on one specific tradition as a comparison? Sure. Take the Protestant tradition. Remaining or Reformed? I'm fine either way. 
Wh which one of you? Oh, it, you know, I, I don't necessarily put myself in either camp, if I'm honest. Which of the five points do you agree or disagree with? Which of the five points? Do you agree or disagree with? I'm not very big on irresistible grace. Okay. But, okay, well, let's just take the uh, Reformed Protestant tradition, then, if that's yeah. the case. Like, uh, okay. say, the 1646 Westminster, 1689 London Baptist as representatives of such tradition, right? Well, yeah. What would make us uh, true, as uh, from my perspective and from a Latter Day Saint perspective, and um, false from a uh, Protestant perspective, would be the issue of uh, ultimate authority in Protestantism. While well, there's other right, authority, so authority. Sorry, I, yeah, I, authority. I have ultimate authority. Yeah, yeah, ultimate okay. authority. My but hearing you, is you, you, as, well. As you get as you, as you listen to him talk, yeah, he, it'll it'll actually get clear. So, and <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah, there was a there was a little bit of a, a he's, little. He's I'm Irish, Irish from yeah. Ireland, and English yeah. is a second language. So, uh, with that as a preface, there's the issue of ultimate authority. Like, well, in Protestantism, okay. there's other subordinate authorities, like the importance of the local church, local pastors, tradition. In some sense, uh, the only thing that actually has normative authority in Protestantism would be the 66 book canon of the Bible, a la traditional models of Sola Scriptura. We would not hold that. For instance, we don't believe that public revelation ceased with the death of the Apostle. We actually would believe that's one of the theological errors that crept into Christianity, um, especially uh, around the second, third century uh, as a over uh, uh, reaction to Montanism and other things. Uh, we would disagree about well, we would all agree that the meritorious source of the uh, salvation is the atoning sacrifice of Christ. We would disagree about the instrumentality. When Protestantism, you have faith alone, not in an antinomian sense, but like a, f uh, a faith that's alone, but you know still produces good works as fruit right. and so forth. I don't want to seem like I'm straw manning Protestantism. No, you're good. Her theology, uh, it's done through the instrumentality of water and baptism. So baptismal regeneration would be an issue about that. The nature of justification is a purely forensic and external, or is there an internal change in the person as well? So there'd be like a host of other issues as well. That comes down to issues like priesthood, authority, sacramentology, and other issues as well. And there would be other issues as well, like vis-a-vis -vis Christology and anthropology would be other issues as well. So, so from what you know about Latter-day Saints, would you consider us Christians? Um, again, like you said, you know, there's some, some level and nuance to the term, right? So do, do we mean in the general sense, I think I'm going to operatively define Christian as someone who is revering Jesus Christ as the son of God and is relying on Jesus Christ for salvation from sins, using that as the most broad, basic umbrella term, um, I do I think there is room for LDS people, individuals, to belong in that umbrella. Uh, that, yeah, and that's not what I'm saying. So within, because that, that's that's basically saying if certain individuals within the church believe what you believe about those topics, then you would consider them Christians, regardless of whether they adhere to other beliefs you disagree with. But what I'm saying is, is the LDS church's position on the doctrines, for example, that Robert identified yeah. Would those mean that anybody who believes those doctrines could be a Christian? Um, I, I believe that what we need to consider there are first tier issues or you know primary issues versus tertiary issues, right? So when we say, like, we all agree that following and adhering to the doctrine of Jesus Christ is what it I mean at its core when you define Christian you mean somebody who is of Christ right a follower of Jesus and and what he says and what he teaches and so in as much as we can agree on what he teaches then if we agreed on what he teaches and we both agree that we accept those teachings then that would define what a Christian means I would think I would operatively define some of those teachings differently does that make sense well, I understand what you're meaning. Um, I would just say, like, when a Protestant framework, when it comes to, say, uh, primary and tertiary issues, outside, like, say, maybe the explicit um, reference to, unless, of course, you believe, by Ami will die in their sins, a la John Asian, a few other texts, um, there's no real basis for, like, a Protestant claim, well, that's uh, a primary topic, um, that's a salvation issue, and that's a real, generally a tertiary issue. Because I, would, I would disagree with that. I mean, okay. I think we see precedents for that, and, you know, Paul is 
confronting these issues um, in the various churches, right? Where but he was, re he, he was living during a time of public revelation, correct? I'm sorry? I'm he the was, dog he, barking. He was living during a time of public revelation, correct? Paul is living during a time of public revelation. Yes. Uh, defining public revelation as, yeah, like not limited to private. Yeah. Well, I mean, Paul is a, writing revelatory scriptures, your, but, yeah. and other sources of eternity are as inspired as the written word at that time. Yeah, Paul is is writing revelatory scripture. And he's also basing his teachings on other sources that were not written at the time that had the same uh, eternity as scripture. Other sources not written at the time that were on the same basis of authority. Yeah, that were that were equally God inspired. Or yeah, I think there's sources. there's the the oral tradition that occurs. Mm -hmm. um, but so he was relying on two sources at the time. So like, how can a Protestant who doesn't have public revelation going on, and although all, there are certain other authorities like the Church, um, they don't actually have binding authority, if you will, or they're not normative authority. Well, how can I, one I think... actually how can one actually confidently be sure that say eschatology, like say the difference between pre or post millennialism or all millennialism is indeed just like a minor issue. It's important, but it doesn't affect salvation and yeah. so forth. So I'm going to, I'm going to work justification on ease. Yeah. I'm going to work on, on that specific issue. I, I think that's what we're kind of after, right? Is, is, is it essential for salvation for you to have like a hundred percent of doctrinal belief? Correct. I don't think that you would say that. I mean, maybe I misinterpret, but I mean, on a personal level, no. But like, no church can actually. It's like the Judaizing heresy in Galatia. Like, I'm sure the Galatian heres, uh, heresy arcs were like pretty orthodox when it came to say, most other things. Like, God, uh, Paul does not condemn them about, like, say, the nature of God, the nature of Christology. Yeah. He basically condemns them about the instrumentality of how one became a member of the new covenant, a la Galatians one six to nine in the entirety of the epistle. Mm. But be that as it may. Um, an organization cannot actually preach authoritatively something that uh, is actually a gross error at the very least. I think we would all agree with that. I mean, like, say, not, you know, I'm a former Catholic. Um, you've probably never been a Catholic, but like, take uh, Romanism, for instance, like um, elevating, like, say, the Marian dogmas, like the Immaculate Conception, Baldy Assumption, which are not apostolic in origin, as they fide, as in apostolic in origin, definitional of faith. I think we would both agree that's a grievous error, right? Regardless, I would like, say, say, yeah, the, the Catholic, the, the Marian dogma, that kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. Or if one denies a article of faith, like say, I, uh, Latter-day Saints believe in baptism regeneration, I'm guessing because you're a Baptist and, you know, you have certain other leanings, you would reject that. Um, you know, you know, that if one of us is in error, that's actually a grievous error as well, because it's uh, um, about the instrumentality of how one is justified, how is one uh, regenerated as well. So an organization, at the very least, has to have this ability to actually be able to have confidence that what she's preaching is true. And you kind of lack that in Protestantism because there's nothing that has like an active living vice that you can actually go to, like a magisterium or some other teaching attorney. And that's not a denial, like say, Scripture is called breed or it's living out like Hebrews 4, if you think the word there is actually written in Revelation. But like um, when it comes to say something that's external Scripture, that's a binding attorney that can actually settle these issues. Because, for instance, if, if it turns out like eschatology is actually a primary issue, you know, almost as important as justification or Christology, uh, that's a lot of people uh, up the creek, if you will. Uh, so, again, one has to actually be able to like um, know these things. Yeah, no, and you said a lot of things there. So I want to make sure that um, we can yeah, do, do as much with as many of those as sure. we can. I think the first thing that we should be after is, okay, is it possible to be incorrect on any level of doctrine and not that let that be a salvific issue? Now, I'm going to operatively define salvific. Are as you talking about individuals or a uh, ecclesial body? Yeah, I'm talking about the individual level, right? Um, so at an individual level, um, we do not have reason to believe that your knowledge or acceptance of specific doctrinal issues ultimately and solely defines your salvation, defining salvation as post-death uh, relationship and uh, proximity to the Father. Okay? okay. So using that, right, when we look through Paul's writings, he's writing to the churches consistently correcting 
false teaching or false doctrinal issues, right? And what we see in Paul's writing is we see at times he confronts some of those issues and some of those people teaching false things as being outside of the body, right? He would, he would represent some of the Judaizers, like you mentioned in Galatians, he would represent those as exterior, uh, those are not people that believe the same things as us. Then he would also look at somebody who is, say, eating meat sacrificed to a temple, and to that he is calling that person a brother or a sister. He's saying, hey, if you're teaching that whether or not you eat meat or uh, sacrifice to a, a, a pagan idol, if you're teaching that that is something that you cannot do, he is saying he disagrees with that. But at no point in that discourse is he delineating that that person is outside of the body of Christ. So what we see is a pattern for Paul correcting doctrine, but not all doctrine is something to which he ascribes uh, you are in a doctrinal error that means that you are outside of the body. Okay, well, just a couple of things. First of all, I would agree that there are like different uh, degrees of culpability. I don't think anyone would deny that, for instance. I'm sure you would agree. Yeah. Perhaps from your perspective, a Roman Catholic could be saved in spite of not because of Roman Catholic theology. They could be in error thinking, say, Mary's body assumed her queen of heaven, while someone who's like a professional theologian, like say a Scott Hahn, he has greater culpability. So no one's really denying that there's like different gradients. The only issue is like, how can you as a modern day Protestant who does not believe in public revelation and believe that the only thing that actually has binding authority is the 66 books of the Protestant canon, how can you actually make these decisions when it comes to say issues that come up after the apostolic era? Uh, for instance, uh, do you believe that uh, Nestorianism intrinsically is a theological error that could actually be seriously uh, called into one's crust and uh, one's salvation that they held to it. Remind me exactly Nestorianism. Uh, Nestorianism is what was condemned at the Council of Ephesus in the, four, in the year 431. Um, there's a debate as to whether Nestorius himself taught it, but it's a view that um, in Christ, although he has a human nature and a human will and divine nature and divine will, he's actually functionally two separate persons. There's a, dis there's a real distinction in um, operations between the humanity and divinity of Christ. So it's basically two people in the one. And that's yeah, actually a very I, common functional error I've come across amongst many, well, many Protestants. Yeah, I mean, I would reject that that doctrine. Oh, yeah, but do, you uh, believe do I think it's a salvific issue? Um, it's dealing with Christology. Do it. Because it's dealing with Christology. I'm sure we can agree, like, Christology is the heart of the gospel, if you will. Um. I, I don't necessarily think that would be a salvific issue. And the reason I'm going to make that difference is because what I find in the writings of Paul is the only time that Paul seems to indicate that something is a salvific issue is it is whether or not your faith is in Jesus or your faith is in um, somebody outside of Jesus or if your faith is in your works rather than in his atonement, right? But so if someone's faith is in Christ, that's not simply like an intellectual assent. That's a, a acquiescence, if you will, uh, that you will follow him and believe in he, the reality of who Christ is. For instance, I um, would you believe that Unitarians who do not believe Christ pre-existed, for instance, are, in your view, Christians in a self-ethic sense? Um, I think we we have to be careful to not draw too harsh lines. And the reason that I say that is if we think about somebody say like the thief on the cross right are you are you doing a doctrinal test on the thief on the cross are you saying hey if i ask him the right question at the right time is he not going to be in paradise is he not going to be able to enter into uh to go back to the father if you will if he answers incorrectly well, well, before you kind of go down the whole typical thief on the cross, uh, one, that is an exception to the normal rule in the New Testament, even if you take I mean, him into heaven. Secondly, he went to paradise. Yeah, you, no, I'm saying you're saying kingdom, he's an exception. I'm just saying, you know, that... No, no, uh, even if you think he went to heaven, but he said it when he went to paradise. Sure, and on that which I would day, agree that... Christ yep. did not go to heaven when he died. He went down I agree. to Hades. I agree. So, we're not actually told about like uh, the final destination, if you will. And of course, we would believe in posthumous salvation. Well, not necessarily. But he if he you said, read, you'll be with me in paradise, not that you'll be with me in 
Yeah. No, it says I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Correct. Right. So yeah. paradise is synonymous with uh, the uh, Abraham's bosom, right? Which is where Old Testament saints would reside, right? So there's still two realms that exist in Hades. If you base it on Luke 16, but Luke 16 is a, a Christianization of the Egyptian parable. Um, it, um, if you ever read, like, say, uh, any conservative scholar on Luke, they'll discuss that. It's not a good text to go to. But even proceeding from that, if you okay. read the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew and Mark, you get the impression that both the malefactors were railing against Christ. Yeah. So it's I mean, the malefactor. Point of, the point of contention there is you rule out the possibility that the thief could have a change of heart on the cross. Oh, I believe he did, and that's unique to yeah. Luke. I'm not saying they're contradictory. You have to read the synoptics. Okay, I was just making sure, because that seemed to be where we were going. No, no, I'm making a point. So it seems like he wasn't repentant, but he also has a very good evidence of the eschatological message of Christ, like the coming in the kingdom. He seems to recognize that Christ is divine because he actually says, the other, you're actually reviling against Christ, God. Yeah. So it does seem to indicate, uh, and very number of early Christians believe that the this malefactor actually had knowledge of the gospel prior to being on the cross. Sure. But like he, even if you think like that's a salvation scene, that's not the normative function of new covenant salvation. It's either true repentance, it's uh, true baptism, and so forth. So like trying to appeal to the uh, teeth on the cross, um, it's kind of the rag doll of Protestant eyes of Jesus. It just doesn't hold up. But just to yeah, go and, back and to I'm you, going to point out the Unitarian thing. Yeah, so. Okay. Uh, when Jesus says, like, uh, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins in the Gospel of John, um, you would agree, like, uh, Christology is pretty important throughout the uh, entirety of the Bible and what it means to be orthodox in one's theology. I mean, I, I think, again, operatively defining words, operatively defining concepts that we're doing is ideal. All right, so... Um, hypothetical like you're using unitarians uh, yeah i interact quite a bit with christadelphians and they're unitarians so this is like a yeah. first time experience for me so taking that as an example um when we look at the scriptures when we look at the text if somebody denies the lordship of jesus that is somebody that would not be able to enter into his kingdom so that that would be a christological issue now <laughs> Um, I think you were talking about um, uh, covered so many things, but talking about how the hypostatic union works. I'm not. No, I wasn't talking about the hypostatic union. I'm just saying if someone was a Nestorian, like they held to Nestorianism, like say the Assyrian Church, do you believe that they're outside, say, salvation? Because that would be. I'm unaware of any Protestant who officially there's loads who functionally are Nestorian, but like would officially hold to like a, an, any Nestorian Christology. Yeah, so so do I believe it is essential for salvation? Does somebody have the correct view of the fully human interacting with the fully divine? Or at least not to knowingly reject, say, the hyperstatic union? You know, I, I think what we have to then look at is, okay, again, are we applying doctrinal tests instead of tests of faith right well this is christology so like if one is actually holding like say to a gross christological error that would be indicate indicative that their faith is in vain i mean to go back to the unitarian example um yeah. there's loads of i because i just interact with them on a number of occasions there's like loads of um say christadelphians but other unitarian groups not unitarian universalists but people who actually are pretty conservative when it comes to say the bible you know they would believe as an article of faith that it's actually blasphemy to claim christ personally pre-existed even yeah. Though say the area. If, if I'm yeah. honest, I think we're kind of deep on a rabbit trail that's not really after the questions that I'm after. Well, you were asking about like um say Christianity, and then you brought up first tier, tier primary doctrines and just trying to like ascertain how you consistently yeah I I, I guess this. maybe a way that this relates is uh, when we look at you know the great apostasy. Um, when we talk about that, when we look at, you know, what the church, what, uh, say, Joseph Smith or following prophets have said about that over the years, I, I definitely am having trouble understanding necessarily what what the church's position is on the great apostasy. Could, could you explain for me, for y'all, like what when you understand great apostasy, what, what does that mean for you? I'll let you go, Travis. I've been talking a lot. No, yeah, just functionally speaking, um, I mean, in its, in its simplest sense, it's the 
um, progressively over time, the loss of public revelation. I think Robert identified one of the dangers. And that's that's kind of the 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 problem with with primary versus secondary doctrines that he was kind of trying to address is that is how, how do you know which are which and how do you know? So, for example, if if I believe something that's false about Christ, or I believe something that's false about the nature of baptism or any other of those issues that are mentioned in the New Testament documents, and I have a misunderstanding, mistaken understanding of them, um, somebody comes along and tries to correct that error and decides that this is this is secondary or primary and you need to believe it and and so on. And there's this dispute and disagreement. How are those how are those disagreements reconciled or remedied? Well, the way the New Testament texts seem to present that is they're resolved through the personal ministry of the apostles, either through oral teaching or letters. And so the loss of that that connection to the divine through the oral teaching of a living oracle in the form of either an apostle or you know an acts prophets that are coming and preaching in the name of God, that that loss of authority and vesting authority in the biblical canon itself led to other issues, which are usually primarily what are mentioned by Latter-day Saints. So most Latter-day Saints you'll talk to will boil that down to the loss of priesthood authority following the death of the apostles. However, mm -hmm. what the what the primary cause of the apostasy is, is the rejection, the gradual rejection of public revelation in the form of an apostolic ministry that was occurring in the first century. Okay. Just, just on the uh, just on your view of the apostasy and so forth, um, would it be your view as a Baptist that like um, there's no great apostasy and one can actually find true believers in what you believe to be the gospel in say the opening centuries of Christianity after the New Testament? Um, yeah, that's kind of the problem uh, that I'm trying to understand the the LDS position, which is, I, I like I read Joseph Smith. Saying, well, what are, what are you reading in Joseph Smith? So that's kind of why I ask you. So you've read the Book of Mormon, you've read parts of the Doctrine and Covenants, and you've read some yeah. Bruce R. McConkie books that aren't really considered authoritative. What what no, I, I get that? What, but I mean, I think what, he's what is it that you're doctrine from the Church, and he's cited on your site several times. Right, so. but that, right because he he has an apostolic function. He's an apostle, but yeah, in 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 Mormon doctrine, for example, he's writing in his private capacity as an individual, not. In his capacity as an apostle, in fact, he wrote that book sure. before he was an apostle. So, um, so reading from it, Joseph, it would be like it would be like me finding a book from some prominent leader of your own denomination, and then saying, "Well, this is what you believe," and this guy was crazy or whatever. He said something that was in error, and and yeah, we're I, I think the book. difference there. And, would I, be, and I'm so. not agreeing that that Bruce R. McConkie was in error on anything. I'm just saying you're you're taking yeah. a, a text he wrote and making it authoritative against the church. Yeah, I, I think, well, skipping over some things there. Um, history 119. Um, this is history, recounting. What is, what is that? History 119. It's recounting his, uh, his first vision, right? Oh, oh, you're talking about the history. I'm sorry. Are you talking about the, the first vision account in the Pearl of Great Price, or are you reading it out of the history of the church? Um, the particular reference that I'm drawing from here um, is, and I've seen this cited several times, but right now um, the quote that I'm reading directly from is coming from a BYU author um, quoting from, um, let's see here. And who's the author? I, I'm sure he's just some student. Uh, his name's Robert Millett. I, I don't I'm oh, not, Robert. Yeah, yeah Robert Miller was a professor, professor of theology. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he's quoting from history, uh, one nine. That's what he put. I've seen it cited and quoted the same elsewhere. Um, but he's reading Joseph. I mean, he just writes Joseph Smith, history one nineteen. Yeah, it's in the Pearl of Great Price. Okay. Uh, how do you? Uh, sorry. Um, I actually have it here, so I can actually read uh, Joseph yeah, history. I mean, I've got it as well. Uh, yeah, I was answered. I must join none of them, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me, Christ, said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, and that those professors were all corrupt. 
that they uh, draw near to me with their lips, but with their hearts far from me, they teach for doctrines and commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Okay, so I guess my first question is, like, that's an authoritative text for you? Sure. Yeah, that yeah, one okay. is. So working from that idea that that is authoritative text, if Joseph is saying that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, strong language, and that those uh, professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, their hearts are far from me. I mean, for you, what is he saying about the post-apostolic church or lack thereof prior to the restoration? Like, what is he saying um, about the beliefs and the creedal statements of people who profess to be Christians for, you know, that 1400 to 1700 years or so? Well, he's speaking to their creedal statements. He's, he's, Essentially, the, there's language in there from Matthew 15, for example, where it's bemoaning the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are relying on tradition and their interpretation of, of texts rather than accepting the, the preaching of the prophets that have been sent to them on other occasions. And so, again, relegating religion to a consensus and a creedal statement is something that would be contrary to the principle of a revealed religion. And, yeah. and in the in the act of the first vision, Joseph Smith is overcoming the apostasy through accepting and acknowledging that God is a living being who can interact with his children mm -hmm. and reveal to them. So that very act is overcoming, like I said, that principal cause of an apostasy. So and the creeds creed... would creeds would represent a an error that comes out of apostasy, namely so... councils are determining without authority what what doctrine is and how to, how to de de decide which principles doctrines or practices are appropriate in church so is the issue with the creeds the fact that the creeds were made or the statements they made were incorrect yes to both yeah i would say yes to both robert yeah especially the contents of the creeds i mean like yeah. um Millish, I think he's correct, in one of his other articles, believes that uh, one of the creeds in view was the 1646 Westminster Confession of Faith. And yeah. frankly, from a larger saying perspective, what that teaches about, say, absolute divine simplicity, the nature of justification, the nature of God's decree, is frankly blasphemous. Mm -hmm. But there's yeah. other decrees as well, like, say, uh, that of Trent in the Counter-Reformation, or one I think we would both agree with, like, say, the uh, Second Council of Nicaea that dogmatized Icon Federation, you know. Yeah. So, so is it just the creedal statements or, um, I mean, those who know so what I, as well. I guess what I'm after is some of the language talking about the apostasy that occurs in those centuries is not limited to creedal statements. It, I mean, it seems to go further. Um, I'm reading from, uh, Joseph. Yeah, as Fields. I said, those who know and the profess belief in it as well. I'm sorry. Oh, as I said, those who know and they profess belief in it as well. That's what professor yeah. means in the uh, 19th okay. century context. Yeah, right. So, like, if I accept the content of the creed, I am an apostate because the creed is apostasy. You would be embracing the form of false Christianity. So, with right. that, yeah. So, using that, working from that position, um, I think this is an agreement. Uh, this is from Joseph Fielding Smith. It's a state conference message, which I don't know. Is that authoritative for you or not? It depends on what he's. Authority, no. Yeah, it depends on what he's what he's saying, where he's saying it. But uh, a state conference message is was what was his position in the church at the time? This is speaking, I believe, in the office of prophet at the time. This is from 1891, but I may be incorrect at that. Joseph uh, Fielding. Uh, well, there's two Joseph Fielding Smiths. Joseph, uh, yeah. I'm this guessing is, it's Joseph F. Smith, uh, his father. Yeah. He would, they were both Fielding Smiths. That's what we did. 18, 1890. Yeah. Well, anyway, 1891, uh, November 2nd. This yeah, is from, would be his oh. fault. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. You can quote. Okay. okay. So he says, For I contend that the Latter day Saints are the only good and true Christians, which is what you were saying earlier, uh -huh. that I know anything about in the world. There are a good many people who profess to be Christians, but they are not founded on the foundation that Jesus Christ himself has laid. So working from what you're saying, which is, I think, what Smith here is saying, is that 
after and I don't um uh, hold on. Yeah, this is from the um church's website on just the topic of the apostasy. It says After the deaths of the Savior and his apostles, men corrupted principles of the gospel and made unauthorized changes in church organization and priesthood ordinances. The apostasy lasted until the Restoration in 1820. So, if hypothetical, make sure I'm understanding. If every believer, every uh, believer, if everyone who professes to be a Christian post creed, post-apostolic death is believing the things of the creeds, you're saying that that is, they are in apostasy. Correct. Well, I think it's kind of an anachronistic claim, like just after the apostolic, yeah. era, like say a few centuries afterwards when the creeds were formalized. No, yeah. I, I get you. I mean, formalization doesn't mean that the, the belief didn't exist beforehand. Oh, but, no, of course not. But yeah. at the same time, like, um, you know, for instance, I think it's really silly to claim like no one believed in, say, the deity of Christ until 325. That's like a really silly Dan Brown type of thing. Right. But that's when it was like more or less like um, the final cherry on the uh, top, uh, on the cake, if you will, or whatever the English expression is. But just yeah. on just on the issue of apostasy, so we're not speaking past one another, is it your view that the doctrines that you would believe to be like, say, normative for a Christian, or at least essential for a Christian, um, were like uh were never lost during like say the first five or six hundred years or even like the first fifteen hundred years of Christianity. Do I believe so I'm gonna operatively give you my answer. Um uh, do I believe that from Jesus's ministry through today that there's consistently been somebody believing and teaching and yeah, the groups of people yeah that you can find to in history that there has always been somebody pointing to salvation in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of God. No, no, everyone believes in that, just like what you mean by that. That's the real issue. For instance, you're a Baptist. So let me just use this as an example. Do you believe, like, say, I'm, I'm guessing as someone who's a Protestant, and if, even if you don't believe in irresistible grace, you would believe, let's say, justification is forensic. It's not transformative. Um, you would believe, for instance, that baptism, while it's important, is not regenerative. And... You know, the typical Protestant understandings of, say, justification and salvation. Do you believe that understanding of what it means to, like, believe in the name of Christ? You know, that justification is external. It, I'm guessing you would believe in some type of perseverance of the saints or eternal security. Um, you would not believe in baptism and regeneration and so forth. Would people who would understand the gospel and justification and salvation in light of that were known from, say, the year 100, like, say, when Ignatius was writing, to like say 14, 1500, even before the time of Luther. Do I believe that from the time of 100 through the time of the Protestant Reformation, that yeah. there were at least people believing you can to in, in history and not just like say hypotheticals? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, was well, somebody well, teaching, writing, proclaiming, yeah, because examining. Like, um, uh, yeah, because I asked that. Those yeah, yeah. I asked that because, like, you know, I'm not saying you're like one of those trail of blood type Baptists, but there's like the view, yeah. like, of course there were people. We just can't really point to them, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think if you're, um, I think you're asking a, um, I think you're asking a question in a particular way that I reject the premise. And let me okay, explain. Okay. Yeah. So. Your, your premise that I think you're leading to is, is say, we're looking at the, the solas or we're looking at, you know, these certain doctrinal positions. One, your premise is that um, people are saying that those are requisite for salvation. I'm not agreeing with that. Um, two, that people are consistently throughout history teaching and writing and professing those doctrines in the same language or not necessarily like languages in English or whatever, oh, but I'm languages not, I'm not saying the same language. I'm just saying functionally. Yeah. That's what I, I'm trying to say. When I say language, I mean like meaning like whether it's Latin or Greek or whatever, mm -hmm. like they're, they're, they're getting after the same thing if they're using different words is what I mean. So I, I, I don't necessarily um, like, say for instance luther is, or calvin is articulating something i don't necessarily think that you can necessarily say that consistently from 100 a.d through you know 15 1600 a.d you're going to find 
at all times, there is a living person writing the same things that Luther eventually writes. So I, I recognize that that is not something that probably exists. But the reason I'm rejecting the premise of your argument is because I don't necessarily think that's a salvific issue in the okay, sense so, of. So, okay, that's fine. So like, again, what would be a generous salvific issue? What would be, say that in again? Your, in, in your view, what would be an example of a really important salvific issue? Um, I think that's a, I, I, I'm really, I'm not trying to be rude. I, I think that you're kind of approaching it from the wrong direction, right? Well, I'm, I, well, I don't think so because you don't believe there was a great apostasy. Obviously, that's going to be a point of contention between us. So I don't want to be, seem like we're speaking past one another. So my view is like, yeah. you would believe that whatever you define to be of great important uh, of salvific issues, like a primary doctrine that one must knowingly accept, and if they knowingly reject it during the precarious stage, you know, yes. I'm guessing you would believe that articulations, or at least people functioning under that perspective, or those perspectives were known from, say, the year 100. I'm just picking that because that's more or less the close of the New Testament. Yeah, I'm, so like, I'm say working 15, with that. Say 15, 17 prior to... Um, say, with, yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, so, 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 what, so if I were to ask you, Alston, what are genuine self-ethic issues, you know, and if you were, um, what would they be? Uh, the, I believe the only salvific issue that is going to come to mind for me is going to be believing in Jesus of Nazareth as God's son and relying upon the atonement provided through his sacrifice on the cross alone for salvation. Would you agree that would be something that has to be unpacked theologically? Because it depend it kind of begs the question, like say, what's the instrument of how one appropriates, say, Christ's safe and righteousness? The nature of justification is it internal or external to us. And yeah. whether or not Christology is important because we can all agree, you know, we can all claim and say Jehovah's Witnesses and Christadelphians and others would claim, yeah, we believe in all that, but those words have to be unpacked theologically. And I'm gonna make a I'm, I'm gonna make a qualification a uh, difference between somebody who uh, an absence of knowledge versus a direct uh, rejection. I think that's that's why, that's why I tried to say knowingly. Yeah, I mean, so I'm gonna make a, a, a difference there. Um, I, I and I think again, you have to, and maybe I'm you know out on an island by myself here. I don't think that I am. I think this holds true within my tradition, if you will. But I think that um, that we are not going to be judged based off of correct, incorrect doctrine um, to the level to which maybe you are ascribing. The reason that this relates to the great apostasy, right, is for for the LDS definition of great apostasy means that there was either an absence or incorrect teaching of the gospel of Jesus post apostolic at some point. And sure. whether that's, you know, 300, whether it's 200, at some point, the chain of priesthood is broken. Yeah. And I believe it was a process. I don't think you can say like, you know, some very naive people believe like say 2025 or Constantine or any of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Like at some point it gets messed up. Sure. And so I think for you to make that statement, you have to say, um, because I, I don't think your your position is one merely of authority. I think that's a key component of your position. No, the position is more a loss of, of revelation. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. well, it, but not just a loss of active, ongoing revelation. Your position is also, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your position is not just a, a, an absence of something, but also a presence of false a presence of incorrect. Is well, I know, but that's that's a consequence of the loss of the direct. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, right, yeah. And I get how that logically follows from your... Yeah, that's belief. like saying, that's like saying, when I turn off the light, it's dark. Yeah. Right, yeah. So there is yeah. dark because the light was turned out. Yeah. Yeah, so I think then what we have to say is, is that what doctrine is the church that existed or thought that they existed turns out to be a false church 
what doctrine or doctrinal stances does Jesus teach that they are getting wrong for millennia until Joseph Smith? Well, the first one would be revelation from God. Receiving, receiving revel. They're getting that wrong? Yeah, for, for instance, there's no... There's rejecting no, it. Yeah, for instance, there's not in the Bible that says public revelation would cease with the death of the last apostle. One has to go outside the Bible to actually hold to such a perspective. I mean, I, I think if you look at Revelation, it indicates the close of Scripture. It's talking about the book of Revelation singularly. That's what happened of the evidence. It's a Are you talking 22, and 18, an, and 19? Yeah, that's an interpretive stance, and I, I can but recognize... No, it's not. The Greek is singular. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, I understand what you're saying. Are you saying that the, the author of Revelation closed the scriptural canon with Revelation 22, 18, and 19? And, and I'm saying that um, that would be the most common Protestant stance, yeah? It, it isn't. Yeah. So okay. I'll tell you, and again, also not to be rude, but that's not, typically yeah. the stance of that I get from somebody who's never read the Bible before. I, and and, and I, you, you with pastoral training... And and schooling I and mean, theology to have that. Because, and 12. I mean, yeah, that's that's yeah. a. I mean, okay. I mean, we have an, we have we I'm have good. people who are who who are professional antagonists against the church. It's literally their livelihood. James White, for instance. Yeah. yeah, who who agree that that interpretation of that text is completely eisegetical. And I and I'm not holding closely to that. Uh, that is yeah. by no means what I mean by, um, like that is where I hang my hat. Like yeah. I'm, 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 I'm comfortable. I'm, I can totally be fine if we're just talking about the book of Revelation itself. I'm okay with that, and I'll still yeah. hold to my clothes of the canon outside of that. Right, and but, how, how, uh, what, is there anything that? else that, that you could point to that would support the clothes of the canon within the text of the canon? Yeah. Such as? Uh, I mean, do we... Uh, church tradition, is, it would be one thing. But that, but that would be external to the canon. That wouldn't be in the canon. Yeah, I mean, is there anything in the canon that suggests that it's going to continue? Yeah, that would be an argument. They were living during times yeah. of public revelation, and there's no hint at they were living during times of public revelation. So they were operating under a church that actually had binding authority. You see that, for instance, in Acts 15, where even they appealed to Amos 9, but it was in a way one could never use exegesis to come to, i.e., uh, the cessation of circumcision. They were living during some time of public revelation where there was other mo modes of God-breed revelation, not just simply scripture, but oral tradition and oral teachings as well. And there's absolutely nothing. In fact, if you were to read, like, say, the earliest post-apostolic writings, like First Clement and Ignatius, they actually believe that their writings themselves were equally as inspired as scripture as well. So sure. there's a belief. Even it doesn't mean it is. Yeah, but it kind of shows. Right, right, right. But, that, right, but even that uh, decision, it doesn't mean that it is. Who, who decided that? I would believe. But where that does God. that just? I mean, I, wouldn't we say that God is the one who decides if some uh, decides if something's inspired or not? Right, yeah, and it would take a revelation. Like one actually recognizes it. Yeah. For instance, it would take um, a revelation for him to do that. Um. So I, I think maybe something I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but your your basis for saying that revelation continues, public revelation, binding revelation for all of Christendom is the fact that public revelation happened. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to straw man, but like public no, revelation happens. I believe in public revelation comes from like, say the explicit teachings of Joseph Smith. I'm just saying, saying if one holds to- Right, so- Let me finish. If yeah. one believes that the 66 books of the Protestant canon are the sole infallible rule of faith and all other authorities, including tradition, are subordinate to it, they don't have any binding authority themselves. You can't actually claim one of the building blocks for Sola Scriptura, i.e. cessation of public revelation, is actually a biblical teaching. Because as I point out to James White, and he doesn't like this, you have to go outside the Bible and privilege that teaching or that tradition on the same authoritative level as written revelation, which of course yeah. is self-defeating. Because what's the uh, teaching of Sola Scriptura? It alone, the 66 books of the Protestant canon, has yeah. this unique authority that no other source yeah. actually has. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I see your argument, and I think it's an interesting one. But uh, I think you, you maybe yourself have the same problem. Why? Well, that's too cocky. Okay. I, I think the problem that you're having is, you're, you're. Do you think there's a biblical reason, New Testament reason, to expect post revelation, the book that is, um, post revelation, continued revelatory uh, writings? Yeah, the, the next generation right. of priests. 
So even that question presupposes soul scriptura. You're presupposing that we I, well, would that's have... what you were you were presenting. No, no, no. The we're 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 not. So we we don't. But we reject the doctrine of soul scriptura. We believe the scriptures are authoritative yeah. in the sense so, that they reflect God's will at a specific time. So the only they, reason that you would suspect that revelation continues is because it was happening. No. So there's a there's a there's a very real example between the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek New Testament with respect to the apostasy that yeah. existed in the, well, the, the apostasy that existed in the first century. That apostasy repeatedly throughout the gospels is a product of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the other Jews who are in power at the time using tradition and the text themselves, absent any public revelation to interpret them. Jesus comes at, with his followers and he accesses public revelation through directly from God, and he's now adding clarifying messages and scriptures to previously existing texts. That is the opening of a canon, which foundationally, everybody would historically agree, if you're a Christian, you believe that the Jews were in apostasy because their understanding of the Messiah was, was, was incorrect. Their understanding of their own scriptures was incorrect. Their addition of traditions that weren't consistent with the law of Moses was incorrect. Jesus repeatedly denounces those practices. And, and yet, they, in the process of interpreting the Hebrew scriptures, he is adding to the canon. And that process didn't start until after his death with the apostles, because your earliest texts are the Pauline epistles written after Christ's death. And so we have these additions of the canon after his public ministry, which also add, even after Paul's ministry, the Gospels and other texts historically. And so there's this process of inscripturation that continues. But, but see, it's an argument that, well, it stopped, right? I, I, this relates, but I promise. What, right. What would, be, what would be the evidence that it should have stopped other than the decisions of human beings. Yeah, so out of curiosity, um, because I don't know this, and I think it relates to the topic, um, I, I understand that as, as you guys revere texts that, uh, well, so in your reading of the Bible, do you include as authoritative the intertestamental texts of you know, Maccabees, for instance? Believe that's man. The, the earliest view about, say, the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonicals is not like as simple as the Catholic view, a la Trent or the Protestant view. If you were to read like section 91 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we actually do have an answer to this, namely that. And then some of the portions are inspired by God, but unless, of course, one actually has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when they read those texts, they won't be able to discern what's true and what's false, you know, because we do believe that there were later interpolations. Now, if you mean right. intertestamental, like in a broader sense, like say one and two Enoch or the testament of uh, the patriarchs and so forth, um, well, it's possible there could be like true traditions, like Jude quotes authoritatively Enoch, for instance, in verse 14. Um, he does, he actually says it's prophecy. That's what the Greek says. Um, no. But if you're going to be planning to say false um, scriptures uh, as an example, like one could also appeal to like more or less contemporary false traditions and false teachings as well in the New Testament era as well. Well, well I, I guess what I'm after is, um, for, like, I'm trying to understand, like, was there a close of the Old Testament canon in LDS position? There, there was a cessation of inscripturation, yeah. certainly. I mean, like, but even in the time of Christ, there was no closed or fixed. Yeah, we wouldn't say canon. that, yeah, and that there was, was tradition. So, so Jesus laments, for example, and it's an example I use all the time with, with, with Matthew and Mark, you know, the Synoptic Gospels have a record of Jesus lamenting the killing of prophets that are being sent to the Jews, going yeah. back to Zechariah from Abel. To, and then he says, you kill, you kill the prophets. How oft would I have gathered you, if, if, but you would not? Talking about how he's sending servants to reclaim them, presumably through oral teaching. And had they been allowed to preach and effectively... They would have also inscripturated, which would have been the tradition, the prophetic tradition back dating to Moses. So the idea that there was no 
public revelation and no inscripturation, no public teaching, no authorized interpreter of the scriptures. And instead, they were basically doing it by consensus or vote or sc using scholarly methods to interpret their texts. Yeah, they were in apostasy. But you're saying because something happened, it should have, I guess. If no. so, like if there was a closure of the Hebrew canon, there I'm shouldn't just have to understand. Yeah, there shouldn't have been. No. And in fact, Latter day Saints would reject the idea that there should have been because we believe in the Book of Mormon. When a people accept prophetic revelation, they continue to inscripturate. So your your understanding is uh, uh, maybe. But we gaps. actually have no. So we yeah. So Latter Day Saints in 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 the ancient world, in is in 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 Israel and in the surrounding areas in Jerusalem, you've got you've got a lack of inscripturation predicated on a on a rejection of prophets. But taken from the Book of Mormon perspective, as prophets continue to minister to receive revelation to teach the people and to be relied on for guiding the people from God, because that's that's the biblical pattern, they continue to inscripturate. So we have scriptures, granted they're from a different perspective because they're on a different continent, but it's still an Israelite perspective, and they are continuing to call prophets, and they're continuing to inscripturate. And yet, that process ceases at some time prior to the birth of Christ for, for several hundred years. Okay, so is there a writing from the apostolic fathers, uh, post-apostolic fathers, like the, the fathers of the church that you believe should be inscripturated? No, but I wouldn't shed any tears at first coming to wherever it'd be inscripturated. I'm so sorry, I, I can't quite. Uh, two things. One, probably not, although I would love if first Clement were to be, because that's awesome. But first Clement actually believed, he was writing about the year 69, although some believe he was in the mid-90s. He believed that he was writing to the Eustace scripture, and Ignatius of Antioch, who died circa 107, believed what he was writing to the Trillians, for instance, were God-inspired as well. I just brought that up because it shows that um, even after the uh, so supposedly close of the uh, New Testament canon, I love the final book in the New Testament, and seemingly using Google's revelation based on your previous comments, uh, there was still a belief in the believing community who received these texts that there was still ongoing God-breathed revelation going on. Yeah, but I think there would be more of historical witnesses. Yeah, so I, I guess uh... But maybe I should ask you this um, because you would hold to like exclusively the, for the New Testament, the 27 book uh, when was that actually authoritatively decided or would you believe that just like a reception theory um, you know, God's people just passively over time just came to recognize these 27 books alone as the contents of the New Testament. Yeah, I think at the moment of writing and the moment of, you know, as composition, if you will, that is an inspired authoritative text. I'm talking about, oh yeah, but I'm talking about the canon. You no, know, for instance, yeah. like when Paul dictated to Tertius Romans, we would all agree that was like scripture and that should be part yeah. of the canon. But the recognition by the believing community to, like, say, these 27 books, to the exclusion of all letters, are part of the authoritative canon. For instance, like, Paul references a letter he wrote uh, before 1 Corinthians to the Church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. But that's not part of the canon. In fact, it's been lost to the uh, sands of uh, history. So, yeah. you know, so we do know, like, he wrote books that are, were never inscripturated. No. Yes. Even if you don't believe it was inspired or not. So when in history did the 27 New Testament uh, book canon came to be recognized as authoritative and the, so, um, what exhausts, if you will, the category of the New Testament? Do you believe it was in the moment of time, like say a local council like Hippo, or do you believe it was just passively recognized and at some point in time during this um, period of time, it came to be recognized by God's people? Yeah, I, I think. And the public should tell Yeah, I think given the way that you're structuring the answer, trying to be fair to the way you're structuring the answer, uh, I'm gonna go alongside more of the um, the text is written and over time it is passed around and it's recognized, but I don't believe that it's a a, a situation where it becomes necessarily canon. And I would reject that. 
Well, when I say becomes canon, not saying like uh, becomes god breed or anything like that. Just like, no, um, and I don't think that's like, what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, but, no, uh, but I think there's a definition or a, a difference between recognition, widespread recognition, and authority. I don't necessarily think that any of the councils are authoritative. Sure, but do you believe, like, say, the recognition is itself authoritative? And for instance, if someone were to go up to you, like in your local Baptist church, and say to you, like, um, I really like the New Testament, but I don't believe, let's say, Jude and Second and Third Peter are actually uh, scripture. I've studied this sure. myself, you know, and I'm pretty confident in like my study of scripture that we should not believe in Jude and Second and Third John. So um, I don't believe it's God breed scripture. Uh, do you believe that would be like a issue when it comes to say local church government and people um, being accepted? Honestly, I, I, I don't think it matters. So uh, the contents of the canon don't matter. No, I think the way that you phrase the question doesn't matter. Like you, you put it in a position of local church government. And, okay. Um, yeah, well, like um, I'm not after local church government. Like, okay. In, do you in, believe? In that sense. Okay. I okay, think what, like... what what I'm after right now is like, you know, you, you're really uh, a strong position for the LDS church is you know this universal authoritativeness, right? And and so, I, I think that um, you know you. Like I, I'm going to reject the authority of councils, and I'm comfortable with that. Okay, so um, do you believe that's based on say the uh, right to private interpretation for the uh, Christian, like Luther and other historical Protestants believed in? I, I think uh, I think we're approaching. I think we're asking the wrong question, right? Like, well, well you said you would reject say the uh, authority. I'm just saying, like, do you believe that? Um, to be based on the belief that the individual Christian actually has the right to conscience and to re um, reject any authority that they themselves believe to be against scripture. Yeah, and again, I, I think we're we're not asking the same questions here. Um, and, and what I mean by that is... I know I, this, this, this does come down to like the issue of like binding authority and final authority because yeah. as a Baptist uh, and, and as know, a Latter-day Saint... I, I believe me, like I get where you're coming from. I'm just trying to answer what I'm trying to answer. Um, I think what I'm saying is, is that if if God is the ultimate authority, um, authority only matters so much as is, as in it is agreement with Him, right? So so any authority that proclaims to be an authority that is in disagreement with God is a false authority. Sure, but that requires one meaningful interpretation. I think we would all agree with that. And also how to delegate and ju uh, adjudicate between differing claims of interpretation. That's why when you said like a Christian, and I'm sorry if I'm going to butcher this, like someone who places their trust in Christ, he believes in his name and so forth, those things have to be unpacked because you could have a, an Arian, you could have a Unitarian, and you could have, in this case, a Latter-day Saint and a Baptist agree yeah. when it comes to the words, but when it comes to the interpretation that's the issue. And well, if one's interpretation, and I'll, you know, I'll let you go ahead, Travis, but like I'll, at the end of the day, like when it comes to some of these topics, like there are like interpretations that have to be binding or not. And as a Protestant, you lack that, um, the binding authority or the normative authority, if you will, yeah, of any other but, structure. But I'm, the oh, sorry, Travis, you wanted to say something. Yeah. yeah so just, just kind of as a, as a kind of going back to, I, I guess what your point is, I'm trying to gather what, what, what you're getting at, but um not, not the, uh, difficult, but i have to walk back home and pitch dark so like if we could just like maybe yeah yeah like, say 10 or 15 20 minutes, minutes. So that's yeah. Good, yeah. Yeah. yeah sure um so in looking at in looking at so for example oftentimes when i talk to evangelicals of different stripes they they're um most of the time they're very nice but sometimes they're pretty heated and they come in with this accusation that latter-day saints are christian and the primary concern amongst that is one we're, we don't believe what the Bible says about certain things. That's usually relatively superficial, and, and we can we can discuss that. But one of the primary concerns they have is that we believe in a different Jesus. Our understanding of who and what Jesus is is wrong. And yeah. then they list they list a series of what usually end up being misrepresentations of our theology. They spit those back at us, and they say, you believe in this Jesus. He's a created being sure. and all these different things that they misrepresent our theology. As a result, it doesn't matter that I believe in Jesus of Nazareth that he died and was rose he rose again the third day my jesus is not the saving jesus i believe in a different jesus therefore i am going to hell for for confessing the wrong jesus so even though i would 
I would say, no, my Jesus is the Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified by Rome, who preached in the Gospels, who rose again the third day. I've read the Gospels. I accept that Jesus. They're like, yeah, but you have these other understandings of who and what he is that are inconsistent with our beliefs, and therefore you are in apostasy, you're a her heretic, and you're going to hell when you die. Yeah, so I, I, and this is really, I think, a key point in my confusion with LDS, right? So your your discussion right there seems more geared towards convincing me that, no, we're really not all that different. No, it's not. And, we're very okay. different. Okay, well, then that's where I'm super confused. Because yeah, we're very different. That's how that no, comes we're very, no, we're very different. What I'm saying is, is your, your, my, my understanding of what your point is, is basically yeah. for centuries, people just kind of believed in Jesus and, and that's Protestantism. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and they're saved because they believed in Jesus and put their trust in him, whatever that means. Robert's yeah. point was, is that has to mean something. There has to be some unpacking of those concepts. And that is what's often been presented to me by every evangelical I've ever talked to. So my, my issue there is, is I don't disagree that we have completely different understandings of the nature of God and things like that. That's sure. perfectly fine. But arguably from our position, we are correct. Our theology is sound and correct. I get you. And, and, and yours is not correct. Now we grant you grace based on, you know, the largely the understanding that what you believe is predicated on certain false assumptions and, presuppositions that have led you to what you believe but irrespective of all that i am told i am not a christian i am going to hell when i die and we have to unpack our theologies yeah and 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 you know we've not gotten a lot of time to be able to to dive into like yeah i don't profess to know everything that you two as individuals think i think really I, i'm just trying to understand like and here's where my my real confusion lies. well it's it's very simple robert and i accept the doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's yeah. what we accept. So, so um, w my my confusion lies in my interactions with LDS missionaries have frequently been this confusing battle between, on the one hand, them trying to explain that we're different, and then by the end of the conversation. I'm being tried to convince that really we believe in Jesus just like you believe in Jesus. And we've given you all we can give you. Um, literally, the, I mean, the things that I've been told have been akin to, hey, man, you you are on the right track. You've received enough clarity. Um, you know, well, like I'm not super concerned about you. There are people that don't know Jesus. And to me. I have a hard time reconciling what the LDS missionary says at the end of that conversation with the teachings of the great apostasy that says all these creeds are an abomination. These creedal statements that, you know, for centuries people believed. I mean, I, I understand. I recognize, and, and as you did as well, that there are significant differences between us theologically. But I have a hard time reconciling that with the missionary who says, ah, but you are similar enough. I don't need to spend more time with you. Right. And I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a really important point. And, I, and the missionaries are often not clear, clear on this point. Their job is to teach a series of outlined lessons and then encourage you to read the book of Mormon. Yeah. Conversion to the church requires independent, careful, deep, diligent research. Like Robert, for example, didn't join the church because some missionary answered his questions. Sure. Because Robert learned very quickly, as I have myself, as missionaries, especially having served a mission myself, 18 to 20 year old kids don't understand a lot of these issues. They don't like they lack the knowledge. So appealing to them for answers is probably not a good idea. It's also the reason why the they're encouraged to bring members to discussions or to help also. But yeah. also, too, the church has vast resources available online, and we have our scriptures. The, the Doctrine so, and Covenants, for example, clarifies a significant number of these doctrines. Yeah. And But but yes, there are differences. If there wasn't differences, if you and I were just the same. Yeah, there's no permission. point of that. I mean, great apostasy yeah, no really isn't that great if we believe the same thing. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't believe the same thing. And we're not saying so, that we do. So let me ask this. Based on the conversation that we've had so far and the differences that we have theologically, 
is your position like, hey, your your differences with me are significant enough that I need to continue to answer any questions that you have and talk with you? Yes. Okay. Because this is genuinely the first time I have, and I have talked to lots of LDS people over the years, genuinely the first time, only, okay, second time I've gotten a missionary to connect me with somebody else other than them. And this is the first time that a person at this level has said, I'll talk to you more than other than this one conversation. No, no yeah. I, the, the, the difficulty with that is, is that's just people. That's not the church. That's no, that's I, just people across the board. And, and I get you. Um, yeah. And, and so everything that I've received up to this point has been vastly different than that. So I'd welcome the, you know, the ability to have continued conversations. I guess my, my, I, I still, guys, I, I and maybe I'm missing what you're saying. Like, in order for you to say that the great apostasy exists. Well, we've already admitted that it did. No, 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 right. Yeah. So you we've have to both, say. Yeah. Well, we, so I like, think we've all agreed that there was a great apostasy, even if you don't acknowledge that that's what happened. Yeah. So in order for you to say that, like, there is. Um, the LDS understanding uh, that basically like the gospel, the principles of the gospel were lost. I mean, that's well, what that, that, that are changed, that are changed. Yeah, which, is, which is why I said like the, that uh, the theological statement you made has to be unpacked. I mean, all traditions right. would agree with that at the very least. Yeah. yeah. So, so the gospel in its simplest form, as I understand LDS presentation, this is from, Third Nephi 27, 13 through 22, probably a, a summary statement. But Jesus sent by the Father, um, he whoever repents, believes, and is baptized in his name, endures to yeah, the we're, end. Yeah, Watch we're familiar the with the passage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what of that was lost in the great apostasy? Baptism. That's the correct it. mode of math, the correct mode and authority of baptism, the true nature of God, the true nature of the atonement, how it's applied. I mean, the, the thing is, is that all of that has to be unpacked. Yeah. To think, so, that, to think this statement, if read, is salvific. If you believe this statement, the issue with it is, is it's like, okay, well, what is the nature of Christ and God? Yeah. And, and, to, and then that's basically like, if, if one paragraph read is sufficient for salvation, I mean. No, and, and that's so, so. Incredibly superficial, I guess. So it's. um jesus you're saying i have an incorrect understanding of jesus the nature of god yes because you believe in the trinity i imagine okay so what's the differentiation like well, we, uh, go ahead like and well, the two second version as much we, as we, we we reject the, the the formulation of the trinity yeah so so is uh w what's the significant difference just related to the differentiation between the son and the father well, your well, understanding we would, of... Go we, ahead, we would not believe in divine simplicity. We would believe that there's no species differentiation between us, God, and man. So the hyperstatic union kind of makes uh, Jesus into a publish at times, especially in light of Mark 12. And we would believe that they are numerically distinct from one another. Um, so That they're distinct from one another? Numerically they're numerically distinct. distinct yeah. They are two yeah. beings rather than just two persons within one being. So, so although, the they, although they have, like, say, the uh, indwelling unity or perichoresis, they have numerically distinct wills, although they're unified with one another, and they have distinct natures in a real sense than the later 4th uh, century understanding of what hyperstatus uh, meant. And so, on, a, on, a broader, on a broader scope, the difference is, is as, Jay, as uh, Robert said, that the difference is, is functionally a distinction between the natures of humans and God in what you believe and with respect to what Latter-day Saints believe. We don't believe that there's a species yeah. distinction. And as mm -hmm. a result of that, our, our objectives and our purposes in using the effects of the atonement are significantly different, much improved in Latter-day Saint believe theology. In the Godhead, right? You believe in three, you, you would say three beings, right? You right. Would say Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Yeah. So... Um, they are not, what is the difference? They are not, they are not an incom incomprehensible um, trinity. We, we would also project like the uh, 
Nicene understanding uh, of consubstantiality. And although it's not unique um, to Latter-day Saints, we would not, we would only believe that the person of the Father is autoteos. Um, yeah. What does autoteos mean? Uh, basically, God in and of himself. Uh, Eastern Orthodox also believe this. Um, basically, Christ derives his divinity, not in an Arian sense or temporal sense, but it's based on his indwelling unity or perichoresis with the Father. Uh, there are some traditions in the uh, West that would believe all three are alter tales. So. Uh, as I'm understanding what you're trying to say there, the analogy would be like, say, a river and like the head of a river. You know, yeah. uh, the father is the font of the river, the river being Christ, but in, not in a temporal sense like Arians. Yeah, yeah. So is there a time where Jesus is not God? I would say no. We're not Arians. So Jesus proceeds from the father? His divinity proceeds from the Father. He's divine based on his um, perichoresis or his indwelling unity with the Father. That's the theology, for instance, of Hebrews. And but it's Hebrews. eternally existent, eternity past. Yes, we believe, but we would believe everyone has eternally existed. That's part of our theology pre existence. Yes, but but his uh, his identity as divinity is is an eternal, eternal. existence. With, yes. with the qualification I provided, yes. Yeah. I don't find that that is necessarily what I, I see in in the teachings, I mean, the writings. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, maybe I'm, then, I, then I, you're I, likely, like I'm asking you to clarify. Yeah, you're likely misunderstanding them. So take, for instance, um, I mean, McConkie says, Christ attained godhood, yet while in preexistence. I, what does that mean? Like, do you disagree with McConkie? No, because God, divinity in our theology is like a, um, it's a ladder, if you will. We believe he's always been divine, just like, um, to give an uh, analogy, like in Philippians 2, 6 to 11, the Carmen Christi or to him, Christ was actually, actually super exalted by the Father after his ascension. But that does not actually mean he was less God beforehand. We actually do believe that there's, um, I don't know you disagree, but you can shake your head all you want. We do believe that like divinity is not like, say, static. Well, okay, so like I'm really so yeah. So one of the really one of the biggest to... problems, yeah, one of the biggest problems that we have with a lot of people is they will go and they will take statements written by our leaders, and yeah. they fail they fail to do the actual exegetical work to understand those statements within the broader context of LDS thought, as though yeah, one statement, right? As though, but I know, but that's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, that's like saying taking one passage out of one church father and then saying that's that's. Yeah. early christian theology it, it's no, not. I mean, so like i'm i'm trying to basically what i'm i'm wanting to discern is so basically like, in order to know what mcconkey was talking about you would have to know mcconkey you couldn't yeah, read I, one like yeah so i've read a lot of mcconkey yeah so right? and so yeah your understanding of what he believed would be basically him uh, like he's rejecting. using different terms in different ways well yeah. uh, well his his even his understanding of, of the audience so it, it's possible in some cases apostles will actually speak above the reader or the listener sure they're using terms in ways even the reader or the listener is not familiar with believing that they have a fundamental or foundational enough knowledge yeah. of of the prerequisite theology to understand yeah, the concept we do this all the time don't. every day right. insider outsider language right. I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, yeah, and, and that's what I'm asking. Like, yeah. like when um, Milton R. Hunter, I don't even know who that is. Um, okay. It was a general uh, authority Ross. in the mid yeah. 20th century. Okay, so when he says, Jesus became a God and reached his great state of understanding, do you, like when he says a God, mm -hmm. what is your understanding of... Yeah, he's numerically distinct from the Father. But I mean, uh, the best analogy became can became a god. Like, what what does that mean? I don't understand what it means. Like, what Milton? I, as much as you know. See, I, I well, so one of the things is is that within LDS thought, LDS thought, the term God doesn't just refer to the Father. Yeah. Okay. No, and I'm familiar should, with that, the LDS position. And, on that. Yeah, and that should clarify significantly. But like the idea that became like like so that Jesus became super exalted after his exaltation. 
like so what what you're saying is is like when he's saying became a god you're saying that he reached a point where people were worshiping him no like did, understanding was, god. was did christ add something to him as a consequence of his mortal existence the accomplishment of his atonement and his resurrection was something added to him um like you like I, I'm was, it, was to... he changed was he changed in some sense He'd accomplished the will of the Father in all things. By yeah. doing what the Father commanded, he had accomplished the will of the Father. Okay. And he was granted the glory to sit down at the right hand of his Father. As as Robert said, he was super exalted. Yeah. Give the name of other, the other name. Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. Um, so is that how you're defining Godhead or Godhood? That's, that's how Latter-day Saints understand it. We know from our scriptures, very clear in our scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon, that Jesus was divinity before his mortal existence. Sure. He came into so, mortality as a result of his condescension. He accomplished his his role as the atoning sacrifice for sins. He was exalted to God following his resurrection. And so they'll use terms of he became God. And what they mean right. is he became precisely like his father in a literal sense. Again, in our theology, God is not like say a static idea. No, mm -hmm. um, just uh, just as like say in most Trinitarian theologies I've read, there was in to the person of Christ like say something added to him, some type of exaltation given to him after his ascension, a la Philippians two and Hebrews. You know that's the analogy um, when it comes to say pre mortality as well. So when in LDS theology somebody becomes God um, in the celestial. walking uh, they're uh, carrying out jesus in his will just as jesus carried out the father's will you you cut out we missed what you said oh i'm sorry um so like in lds understanding when in the celestial kingdom somebody becomes god or a god that you mean it they become the, the better term is for for people to understand what we mean yeah. is to say that we become like god Becoming a god, becoming god, is is confusing to people who are unfamiliar with our theology. The better way to say it is we become like God. In what sense? We become like God. Like in what sense? In, in every sense. Well, you can't you can't be like God in every sense, though. Basically, what? Why not? Our, our view, our view would be like say basically what's called Christification, if you ever heard that term. Basically, all that Christ is, we will become through His grace. Like um, one very good text is like Revelation three, where like Christ is addressing the churches. And, yeah. So, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, dude, seriously, let me finish. Like in verse nine, He promises those who obey, they will be given proskinesis or worship. And in verse twenty one, He says to those who will overcome, i.e., faithful Christians who persevere, oh, they will uh, sit on His um, oh, on the very chair of the Father as He does. And if you're familiar with, say, the intertestamental period, and you've uh, referenced intertestamental literature, to sit on the throne of God is basically to be recognized and become divinized. And that's basically what Christ is saying. Like, just as he's, um, through his own ability, overcame, through his grace, we'll be Christified. And that's basically the message of John's uh, entirety of uh, his writings. Like, in First John 3, we'll be just as sanctified and purified as Christ is when he comes. So we would believe in Christification in a real substantial sense, not simply like a um, end of sanctification type of understanding that some Protestants believe in. Yeah. So, so point of clarification: when you're saying, like, I mean, things, is there anything reserved for the Godhead that cannot be given to someone outside of the Godhead, like things that only belong to the Godhead? Us worshiping them. Okay. So, so in that sense, you the can't father know. remains. Yeah, the father remains the father. Christ remains Christ. Yep. So, so you uh, I, are never going to receive worship. No, the, the, as Robert said, we we can. We're granted to sit on their thrones, but our worship of them. So, will Christ? Will Christ worship his father? Yes. Okay, like that. But who's worshiping you? I I have no idea. Like, where would that person come from? I don't know. 
So your understanding is that uh, that like there would eventually maybe Baptists. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, um, your understanding is that at some point in the celestial kingdom, there will be another people that you would be like Jesus to them. No, I'm, then I'm having trouble understanding. Yeah, like, I don't, because I don't I don't know the answer to that question. That's beyond the scope of our revealed thought. We Latter Day Saints speculate on that issue, but, but we don't really have a. But your expectation is that at some point you would be worshipped in the celestial kingdom. No, my expectation is that I will be like my, the Father, and I will dwell with Him eternally, in whatever sense that means. I will be like Him physically and like Him with the same capacity as He has. Yes. But as far as will I be a god of other planets or things, no, our, our, our faith has tried to clarify on multiple occasions that that's not a part of our theology. It's not a systemized part of our theology, because the idea is that we become gods of our own worlds. In my understanding, that makes no sense. Because what worlds Christ right. has formed or created, he delivers to the Father. Yeah, and that's why I'm super confused. Um, and since he and since he is the type of us, then that's what we would do. We would continue to direct worship and glory to our Father. Jesus, as Jesus says to Mary, "My God and your God, my Father and your Father." So, so there is never a point in the celestial kingdom where you would accept worship. I, I don't know the answer to that question. See, and that's a huge problem for me. And and I don't mean Why? this in a rude way. Because in the one hand, you're saying worship is reserved for the Godhead. But on so the that's other like, hand, that's like me asking that's like me asking you what happens in heaven when you die. Um, I would say I can say things that won't happen. What what happens in heaven when you die? What do that's you? That's not do? what I'm asking. I'm, I'm no, asking. that's what I know. You're you're asking me what happens in heaven after I die. I think there's. I, a I, I've told you what's been revealed to us. Yeah, but you're I saying I have other questions, but those yeah. questions haven't been clarified. No, Honestly, but I think I'll, there's a I'll difference between me asking what will happen or is it is this an impossibility, right? Well, like basically. like that's a huge difference because it, because like for instance, if if I were to say. Is it possible that God ceases to exist? You would agree that's an impossibility, correct? Correct. Yes, correct. Okay. So I think it's fair ground to could ask. I receive could I receive worship from some other classification of people yes. to the degree that there are degrees in the yeah. eternal worlds? Possibly, yes. Yeah. And there I are, think that that's an anti biblical statement. That's a like, what? I, I think that's an anti biblical statement. I think that's a rejection of Jesus' teachings. And that's why I would have a major issue with that. Right, what because you, you, do, you presuppose. Uh, yeah, what would you do in, like, say, passages in the Old yeah. Testament, which are, like, in, say, temple contexts, like First Chronicles 29, where the Davidic king actually receives the same type of worship or veneration as Yahweh does? Yeah, are you speaking in a prophetic sense? No, no, First Chronicles 29, 20, it's about the temple liturgy, and we're talking about, like, how... The do you mind if I pull it up? Go ahead. What's your, uh, you said First Chronicles what? First Chronicles twenty nine verse twenty. Uh, hold on. And not to be rude, but like maybe if we could just uh, end on this point because I have to walk back home in the pitch dark. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, it's fine. And, and he's uh, so attractive, we won't don't want him to get sexually assaulted. Yeah. He's too strong. Do, do, do. So, do, do, do. um, twenty eight. You said First Chronicles twenty eight twenty. No, twenty nine verse twenty. Uh, I'm reading from the ESV. I'll switch to the KJV if you want. No, you're fine. The ESV is fine. ESV is yeah. fine. Okay. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. Yeah, that, that term worship is actually kava in Hebrew. That's the normative term for worship. Uh, not, so, both, as he knows, like, say, Yahweh or God, however you under render it, and the Davidic king are actually given the same type of veneration or worship in that passage. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with that. Why? 
I don't think that it's a normative thing. Um, so, so what we want to do, principles of exegesis, right, is interpret um, particular in light of the whole, correct? Yeah, the analogy of Philae uh, by Prowls like Carson Beggin, just like in this particular text and the liturgy, the Davidic king, he actually does receive worship just as the fault, uh, just as the, the, does. And my part distinction is the day after where sacrifice is given to God. And the yeah, part so, and sense of the whole in what what whole? The part the and whole? sense of the whole? Yeah, what, what, do, what do you mean by the whole? Well, it's convenient for you because you would accept a you know D and C that accepts a, a doctrine you know that it anticipates you getting worshipped, but but I'm saying and from your Protestant point, perspective, it's informed by your a priori assumption. Yeah, that no, and I get it, I get it, but I'm saying at this point in revelatory history, whilst well, well, okay, the people there at the liturgy were yeah. they in error in doing this? Well, I'm going to say a couple of things. Um, we're going to um, point out some things. One, this text is describing something that happened. That doesn't mean that it's prescriptive. It's just descriptive. But God accepts the worship as seen the day after he accepts the sacrifices. Okay. Does it accept, uh, does it affirm and say that, uh, one, I, th I think points like in the logical argument formulation, right? You have to say that this text is saying that, one, it is absolute that the assembly is worshiping the king the same way that they're worshiping the father. That's There's point no one. distinction in the Hebrew to Greek. Okay. That's your point one. Your point two then has to be that this is something that is celebrated and affirmed rather than uh, something that is, um, there's an absence of evidence in that. And then three, you have to show that that is something that um, is a proper interpretation based off of the other texts that we have. What are the texts? No, I just have to show it's a proper interpretation based on the historical grammatical context in which it appears. Yeah, I would say that that context includes the revelatory history. But I think one, you would would well. the one would privilege the uh, immediate context first and foremost. Yeah, and so I'm unaware of any condemnation of this passage, and all these pretty peed off when it comes to idolatry, especially when it comes to the temple context. Yeah, I mean, um, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Um, oh, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What's what's yeah? We we don't we don't have time to go. Yeah, I don't. We don't have time to go into the. Yeah, he's those, yeah, yeah. Way he's contrasting himself. By the way, knows how he speaks as a single person here. Yeah, those are uh, he's contrasting himself with Alan Ashra. Yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable with him speaking in the singular there. I know you're not, but I, I'm comfortable with it. No, I'm comfortable well, with the singular we? as well. Oh, okay. Well, you seem to say that that was a problem. I, I... How many, how many no, divine no. persons are speaking in that text? I'm sorry? How many divine persons are speaking in that particular text? I would say singular. Okay, so I mean, do you, see, do you see the problem with absolutizing that passage, even from a Trinitarian perspective? I do not. Unitarianism. Yeah, I, I disagree. Well, that's your ipsy dixit. That's what? Your ipsy dixit. Your say so. Sure, but you can't say that that's like, um, I mean, how many uh, scores upon scores of Trinitarians are perfectly comfortable with that passage? Loads, and they're inconsistent. I mean, you say they're inconsistent. Doesn't mean that they are. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so. Just uh, as there's scores of Muslims, you think uh, Muhammad's prophesied in Solomon Solomon. Say that again. Sorry. Oh no, never mind. Yeah. So I guess um, is your response to that passage like that's only the Father speaking and Jesus no, is fine for uh, that? There's an immediate historical context to those passages in Isaiah 40 to 47. I mean, it's one the language of incomparability, which is also use of swords, which of course there's ontologically there's more than one sword of cities such as Babylon, Isaiah 45, the verse seven thereabouts. And all that. And also there's a historical context. For instance, in Isaiah 43, 10, when it says there's no savior besides me, Yahweh is contrasting himself with the belief that there's a co meteorix figure called Asherah. That's a historical context. Because Isaiah okay. is actually not strictly monotheistic. You see this, for instance, in Isaiah 6 and the number of... You can quote, laugh as much as you want. Wait, wait, wait I want to make sure I'm understanding. Your position is that Isaiah is polytheistic? No, the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew the Bible is monotheism. Not. Yeah, the, the Hebrew Bible. For instance, Bible you see this in Deuteronomy 32 in its original context before it was corrupted by the Masoretes. 
I'm, I'm, wait, wait, hold on. I, I want to 100% make sure I'm understanding this. This is Come super on. critical. Your position is that Israelites have a polytheistic understanding of the universe. Ancient monotheistic, yeah. not polytheistic. Well, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. A, I, I'm not ancient, to... ancient monotheistic. In, in, what that means is, is within their larger context, Israel has a God, Israel's God. They have yeah. been called to a covenant relationship with their God. Yes. But they understand that there are gods in other nations. Sometimes they pursue nations. they pursue a relationship with the gods of other nations. They don't yeah. worship all of them at once in the polytheistic yeah. sense. They worship yeah. their God, and sometimes they will worship the God of another nation and betray their covenant relationship with the Israel's God. And so yes. that's the, that's believe, the understanding and context of the Hebrew scriptures, and they believe that yeah, these so, are real or ontological existence. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you've, uh, if you studied, let's say, textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible, you kind of see this, like where later generations would actually soften or get rid of certain texts, like Deuteronomy 32 in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or right. just simply the, um, say, Psalm 29 or 82, where there's true gods in the midst of the one true God, and they're not human judges; they're actually Elohim. Yeah. Um, so is that, I mean, is that something that you would say there's, there's somebody that is divine in eternality and power and, and the qualifications of, of the father that exists? Well, so what, what I believe today wouldn't have any bearing on what their understanding is and the context in which they're writing their own texts. And that's what you want to understand. You want to understand what they understand, what they're, what's going on in their heads, Right. That, that I would reject that the gods of these other nations exist or don't exist is, is, is immaterial to the fact that's their world. That's what, so that's what the text will reflect. Yeah, um, but... It's I like think... trying to read the Trinity into the Hebrew Bible, for example. Like even if you're a Christian who believes in the Trinity, there's no Trinity in the Hebrew Bible. And I could disagree with that, but... Yeah, and I... I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with it, but, um... I, I, yeah, that's, it's, it's just, I've had these kinds of discussions with lots of incredibly informed evangelicals and I don't sure. know any of them that would make that claim. So that's okay. Um, I mean, yeah, I, the I, revelation, in fact, most claim that the revelation of the Trinity came in the intertestamental period or prior to Matthew rather yeah. than it being explicated anywhere in the Hebrew text. So, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I, I so would agree. That's an sense. odd. That's an odd position for you to hold. So, I'm going to agree that yeah, that that is a doctrinal position that is clarified. But is there any intimations of it that exist? No, I would no, disagree. There's no, suge there's well, no suggestions mean, of it anywhere. Yeah, the, tr I think the triune absolutely. nature. Well, here's how I would say absolutely that exists. Because what does Jesus point to to claim his divinity? I, I don't know. Are you, going to, are you going to claim Psalm 110 verse 1? Say that again. Or are you referencing like say Mark 12 where he claims uh, Psalm 110 verse 1? No, I'm saying when Jesus is claiming his divinity, right? When he's was when he is Oh, the son of man. Yeah. I mean, I mean, consistently Jesus is pointing to the Old Testament and in anticipation of a messianic figure who is not purely human. And okay. that results in Nicene Constantinopian Christianity. No, I mean I'm I aware like Daniel that. seven how it was received, um, but that still does not make a trinity. It's like people appealing to say triadic phrases in the New Testament and thinking that means the Trinity. Yeah, it's no, Jesus. I think you're you're I think you're equating two things yeah. that should not be equated. You're you're equating um, intimations, hinting at implications with clear uh explicit revelation okay so so i can i can comfortably say and correctly say as i i'm thinking you would be comfortable with that the old testament at least hints to a messianic figure that is simultaneously human and simultaneously god okay. right predicated on the interpretations of the new testament authors yes but you agree with those interpretations, right? I, I yeah, I, I agree with them, but that doesn't so mean then, they're correct. So then, drawing that argument back, then you could say, okay, well, yeah, the the Old Testament right. is so, revealing. You understand, that. you understand that that's just 
once you've presupposed and concluded something I'm not based on your position, then you can read that back into the text. No, I think there's a difference there. The difference is, is, is you're saying it's impossible. Like, and I'm, I'm, excuse me if I'm taking words out of your mouth. Correct me if I'm wrong. The, the, well, there's no, there's no Trinity explicated anywhere in the New Testament either. So I would disagree again, with that. Yeah, and and again, it is you can disagree, but it's it's factually <laughs> just not there. Yeah, you're not going to find like say. Trinity I mean, you disagree, and you can say that it's it's not well, no, there. I, well, give me a passage that supports the doctor. What? Give me one author teaching the Trinity. To a group. One author teaching yeah. the Trinity? Yeah, who explains it? All of the authors. No, no. Give me one author who describes the Trinity in the way you understand the nature of God. Yeah. Uh, so let's take Great Commission, which I'm sure you know, you've got something. But how do you deal with the Great Commission? That's a trionic phrase. It's not the Trinity. Again, yeah, that's um, not the Trinity. That, that there's a Father, a Son, and the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that there's the Trinity as you understand it. So your issue there is one in uh, being. Right, you're saying yeah, three three there's persons more. There's more to the okay. Trinity than simply a so. Trinity. So at least the Great Commission establishes at least three divine beings, no. right? No, it, no, it, it just, just establishes on its on its own. The baptismal form on Matthew twenty eight is a triad. It doesn't even right. address where or not the Holy Spirit's a person. It doesn't deal with Christology, like did Christ pre exist? Is he consubstantial with the Father? These are like all the essential building blocks for the uppercase G Trinity. Okay, so, so the problem, the, yeah. So the problem with what you're doing is you're concluding that predicated uh, uh, on the language of a specific text that uh, that a theology like comes out. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm trying to go slow. I'm trying not to go, you know, say, ah, here's a proof text. I'm trying to go. No, slow. no, no. Well, you're the one who said. Um, what? I'm asking. I'm asking for. I'm asking right, for I mean, a text, not, not yeah. a. Not a mishmash of cherry picked passages that you think formulate the Trinity. I'm asking for Paul teaching yeah. it. I'm asking for Peter teaching it. I'm asking for somebody yeah. teaching it. Does sure. Matthew sure. teach it? Yeah. Okay. So you're asking is there ever one clear text that gives us a Nicene understanding of Trinity? I'll take a point. Like, like yeah. you want a singular text. And that's what the only say? way you would accept that. So, no, no so. Your text. Just make, like, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the question. No, yeah, so just, just, no, look at it this way. Paul writes a letter to a group. Yeah. Right? Sure. Where does he explain the Trinity to that group in a way that they would understand it the way that it was later codified in the in the creeds? Where where does that exist? Because here's the problem. If you've got pagan converts to Christianity, you've got Hebrew converts to Christianity, are they entering Christianity with this understanding that Jesus is teaching that he is the God of Israel, that he has a father and a God, and that they are co-substantially one being. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if they're not just knowing that, where is it explicated or explained anywhere in the biblical text? So to make sure that I understand the parameters of the question, you are... Oh, it have to be difficult, but if we just like end after yeah. this, um, I know we've said that several times. Um, it's always so hard to find an ending place. Uh, we can wrap up on this one. Yeah, um, and undoubtedly there will be cans of worms. Um, to understand the parameters of the questions, you're seeking uh, a singular passage, or you're okay with drawing truths from multiple passages. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding your requirements. I'm really, I'm, I'm trying to go slow. I'm trying not to go, you know, say, ah, here's a proof text. I'm trying to go no, slow. No, no, no. Well, you're the one who said. What? Um, I'm, ask, I'm asking, for, I'm asking right, for, I'm asking for a text, not, not yeah. a, not a mishmash of cherry picked passages that you think formulate the Trinity. I'm asking for Paul teaching yeah. it. I'm asking for Peter teaching it. I'm asking for somebody yeah. teaching it. Does sure, Matthew sure. teach it? Yeah. Okay, so you're asking, is there ever one clear text that gives us a Nicene understanding of Trinity? I'll take a point to make. When you're drawing truths from multiple passages, that's informed by a hermeneutic, you know. Um, and again, this is why I... I mean, that's a presupposition on your part. Well, everyone has hermeneutics here. No, no, no. Everyone's your presupposition is that it, like, you, your presupposition, or at least if I'm understanding... What you're you're saying is that, um, well, let me ask it this way to make sure I'm trying to get where you're coming from. Is it possible to arrive at a doctrinal 
truth using multiple passages. Sure. Okay, but so the, we're but the no, I'm just saying, like, but at the same time, the passages and the interpretation one heist upon them is based on certain a priori assumptions. Here, your acceptance of Nicene, Constantinopian and Christianity. And coming at it from a blank slate as much as that's no possible. Such thing. Every human. interpretation yeah. is theory related. I don't believe there's such thing as a blank slate. <laughs> So, so, uh, to, but yeah. even as a blank slate, even as a blank slate, let's take blank slate. I read the. I feel like you presented an impossible situation. No, for no, 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 no. Even if, let's like, say, blank slate. I I open the New Testament and yes. I start reading about Jesus and he has a father and yep. it talks about a God exalting him and yep. him going up to his father and him receiving the glory that he had with his father and, and, and all that as stuff. A God as yeah, well, and and, and yeah. And so I start talking about, I start reading all that. And at the end of it, I'm like, oh, Trinity. Okay. So if you'll allow me, I'm trying to go piece by piece, go slow about it. So what definitively um, are we relying on to inform those things? A singular thing, multiple things. You're relying on multiple statements from Jesus. Okay. You're holding those things in tension, right? So you have simultaneously Jesus who's, I mean, Actually, let me ask to, ask to make sure I'm understanding we're working some, from the same foundation. You believe that Jesus has a human nature and a divine nature? We would not believe in the hyperstatic union because yeah, we don't believe that there's a question. question. We yeah. believe that he's qualitatively different than us too. This goes this also we, goes back to the fact that we don't believe in creation out of nothing. Yeah, we don't believe in the hypostatic union. So that's the answer to your question. Okay. So oh, just, do, just maybe do you one find question that, on your just maybe on one question on your side and say the New Testament, uh, do you believe that the person of Jesus, not simply his human nature, but the person of Jesus actually has a God, not simply a father above him? Has a God? Above him. I... And, and maybe if we could just like end on this, but uh, yeah. I, I, I tell you, you guys have not given me at all the opportunity to address what you're, you're saying. Like... Yeah, we're, no, we're, we've been addressing we can meet yet. again. We can meet again. We can meet again another time, but I no, I, I just like truthfully, I don't feel like I've been given a fair opportunity here. Um every time I ask a clarifying question, it's it's uh I, I, yeah, so I'm trying to work with what you're saying. Okay. So if we could just work slowly for a minute, do you believe that Jesus in the Gospels is teaching that he is uh, of the same uh, sort of divinity as the Father? depending on which gospel you read, but. But he, yeah. generally speaking, between the four gospels. The, the gospel author of John seems to have some understanding that he's divine. That, well, that's not necessarily the same thing. That's no, not. Yeah, so so you would say in the synoptics, there's no indication from Jesus. That this he, would probably be a better question to Robert. I have a different perspective on the biblical text that Robert does. Yeah. I, again, this kind of goes back to like the much higher regard than I do. Because for the Trinity, it's not simply to say Jesus is divine or he pre existed. It's the issue of consubstantiality. I, I'm trying to. <laughs> so, is yes, this... yes or no? Yes or no? The divinity of Christ in the Trinity is not simply Christ is divine. He's consubstantial with the Father. Is Jesus giving indications of a substance higher than humanity? Is Jesus. Okay. Does the New Testament texts reflect a, a perspective that Jesus is not a human, but a solely, div, but a divinized being? Sure. Okay, so so working from that, now you have a divinized being. Mm -hmm. You also have him referring to the Father, who is a divinized being. Mm -hmm. So that's two. Okay. That's two. You recognize the Godhead, so I, I want to just save time. We're comfortable with recognizing a third divinized being. Yeah, I do so through modern revelation, but okay. You don't find that in the in the New no. Testament text. 
Robert, I personally do you don't, but New Testament text. It's the personhood of the Holy Spirit's not as explicit as the Father. Yeah. So. Okay, but but you could, but generally we're comfortable with three divine beings. Sure, but if you're going to be saying like a, a triad, uh, that does not make a trinity. There's more to the trinity than a triad. And you can, yeah. you can grow in us all, all you want, but again, the trinity yeah. is not something there, a triad. If, 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 you're saying, if you're saying the New Testament reflects that there are three divine beings, Okay, now how do you get co-substantiality out of that? Yeah, um, so now we're arriving at why is it not polytheism, but why is it still monotheism? Because it's the not, Father is the source of the divinity of the Son. Because your understanding of monotheism is not found in the biblical text. That's that's the problem. You're reading into the text a version of monotheism that doesn't exist. It's absent. It's not found in their worldview. Okay, so, so I'm trying to... We're, we're we're again we're trying to work slowly like i feel that my you guys are rushing to address things or you're rushing to ask no, questions no only because robert needs to go that's the I only reason i understand but what the reflection is. is is that you're not allowing me to speak like you no, no, no. i think anyone who actually watches this would actually say you're taking you're, you're taking you're taking a while to speak because the problem with it is is that from my perspective, you're skirting the issue. You're trying to do what skirting. most people do. Guys, like, I'm, I'm just trying to do, go slow. This is, this is the formula most people do, and they do it slow because they think I'm stupid. But it's, I'm not thinking you're stupid. Wait, no, no, no. But there's points there's of a, contention there's a, there's that a are father, critical that's important There's that a father understand. who's divine, a son who's divine, a Holy yeah. Ghost who's divine. There's three beings, but the Hebrew Bible says there's only one God, so Trinity. Okay, so so that's what they always say, and if that's where you were going with that, if you're going somewhere other than that, where are oh, you going somewhere gosh. other than that? Was that your conclusion, or are you going to make another conclusion? Hey, hey, man, like real talk. Okay, things yeah. are getting a little heated. Okay, no, no, I'm not heated, but, and I apologize if I appear that way. I'm not uh, heated no, at all. There, I, I mean, that's my perception. Things are getting a little heated, or you guys are frustrated, and I get I'm it. Not, you, yeah. Okay, so. The reason I go slow is not because you think I think you're stupid. Oh, like, I know, I, I know it's not. Yeah, I, I think that you, we we all accurately rec recognize each other's intelligence. We're fine. I'm okay, not saying okay. that. What I'm saying is, is that you're saying three divine beings. Okay, we're there now. Where? Okay, so if we say three divine beings, is the understanding of the uh, of the Israelites of the New Testament as well? of both you know old testament and new testament throughout is there an understanding of a singular god and you're no. going to say no 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 they were they did not hold the strict monotheism and that's generally ex accepted now by um academic scholarship and exegetes and i reject that like I reject that. That's a like you're you're presenting that as though that's a conclusive statement. Yes, the it's, scholars it's, agree, but they don't. Yes, it's yeah. the overwhelming consensus of scholars. It's absolutely it's not. So, I, I would, su I would yeah. suggest you actually read a scholarship. It's overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's guys, overwhelming. I, I have associate. a master's degree. I'm not you know somebody who's unfamiliar with you know scholarship so, on the topic. Okay, so, like, so you know, with the yeah, and, and Robert the and Robert concept. has a couple of master's degree. And I'm so, just saying. It, so so what? It's an unfair right? statement for you to present it as the overwhelming no, consensus no, is no, what I'm saying not is monotheism. That even like that's unfair to categorize that, 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 that statement. Again, again, because again, it's you're using a lot of words to reach to use the same argument that's erroneously used by other people who try to support the Trinity, namely Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Ghost is God, and as the Hebrew Bible says, there's only one God, except that it doesn't. And, and and that formulation of a, of the divine realm is not found anywhere. Okay, okay uh, so let, let me just ask this because you said you're familiar with scholarship. Um, how do you interpret Deuteronomy 32 from the Dead Sea Scrolls? From the Dead Sea Scrolls, you're saying yeah, that? You said, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, you said you're familiar with the scholarship, and you dismiss <laughs> me when I say this. So this is like the very first thing to discuss when it comes to say the divine council and the nature of God. How do you interpret the textual changes in Deuteronomy 32 from the Dead Sea Scrolls? The earliest text of Deuteronomy 32 we have. You know, I I don't feel it, like. Okay. Am I allowed to speak? Go yeah. ahead. Okay, because I guys, I I say three words, you cut me off. Seriously. <laughs> um. So no, I am not familiar with the reading of 
Deuteronomy 32 from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's you guys, I, I have a year. master's degree. I'm not, you know, somebody who's unfamiliar with, you know, scholarship so, on the topic. Okay, so. Like, um, so, no, I am not familiar with the reading of Deuteronomy 32 from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, but earlier you just dismissed me when I said the majority of scholarship would agree with my assessments. And by the way, even critics of that perspective would agree it's a minority position these days. And one of the main texts, in fact, the text alongside Psalm 82, is actually this text from Deuteronomy 32. So I'll ask the question, and maybe you could end here. Have you actually read the scholarship on, say, the nature of God in the Old Testament or the divine council and how that seeped into, say, the New Testament era? Yeah, so the, the point that I'm rejecting for you is that the consensus is what you say. It is the consensus. Even, even uh, critics of the conservative position say it is a minority position. Okay. I think there's a difference well, between... And so, so, and here's, here, Austin, I just would be real careful about... I have a master's degree, so I understand when... No, 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 no. When, no, no. when earlier no, 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 on, no, no, you don't put also the word said, in my mouth that no, I'm no, presenting. No, no, you, no, no, well, no, 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 no. This said, is super important because I, well, you're you presenting you said, it as I've though read, I'm saying I've I'm a learned, intelligent man. No, no, no. It's Guys, I, I have associated. a master's degree. I'm not, you know, somebody who's unfamiliar with, you know, scholarship so, on the topic. Okay, so, like, I'm saying. <laughs> well, so the, like, like bringing up a degree, I don't know what your point was other than that. If if you had one, that's fine. But no, the but point is, it's, is it's that probably you're... not a smart thing to bring it up and then yeah. have used Revelation 22, 18 and 19 to support soul scriptura. <laughs> you guys are just like interesting in the way that you're like real talk. Not like approaching, you know, things in a like I, I seriously, I genuinely feel and correct me if I'm wrong. I've consistently throughout this conversation tried to ask you guys what you're saying. I've consistently tried to make sure I'm understanding clearly what you're saying. I'm not putting words in your mouth. Okay. And consistently you've made categorical statements about me, like in the way that I'm presenting myself, like, you know, I, I don't know if you recognize that. I, like, I don't. I'm, but but okay. preach, brother. I mean, I'm ge like genuinely. I I'm just a dude. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Trying to understand your position, like. Look, look, look at it this way. That's a difficult position to now make once you've said, "Hey, guys, I have a master's degree." Because my my point would be is, why does that matter? What relevance does that have? You either you either understand or you don't. You either know or you don't. You can you can explicate your position or you can't. It doesn't really matter what your educational background. It's completely yeah. and wholly irrelevant. All yeah. we're saying is, is that I, I am shocked that you're unaware of the literature regarding the nature of the biblical text with respect to monotheism. That's just, I, I, it's, it's, it's an odd thing. Usually I get that kind of a position from people who've literally never read the Bible. Or if they've read the Bible, they've never done any study on it. They've never engaged in any kind of academic study. But but you're a pastor. you haven't given me enough chance to even talk to like hear what I'm saying. If well, I'm okay, so so but what I'm saying is you were taking forever to get to one God, two God, three God, but one God. I just jumped the gun on you because you were taking forever to say it. Yeah, that's I'm your sorry, position, right? Slow. Hey, you know, I'm that's sorry. your position, right? <laughs> no, it's is not. that your position? No, it's not the okay, entire. Then is there a passage somewhere that explains? Gosh, that. Hey, hey, you know, I'm not going to be the last person I, that you talk to. No, uh, you're not. No, but, but you really need to change. The, and you're not the first. I understand that. Your, your manner by which you're going over this is not. Uh, look, I don't need, I don't need uh, politeness um, lessons. From, That's not what I'm trying to give you. Yeah, I don't need politeness lessons. Not and, what I'm and, and, you know, the idea the the problem that you're actually emotional about this is irrelevant to me. I don't, I don't, it's okay. either, it's either, it's either you can do and, and perform and explain or you can't. And this, this like, you guys are attacking me and I'm getting sad and you're not letting me speak. We have let okay. you speak significantly. <laughs> that you're taking forever to get your words out. Yeah. Well, Robert has to go. I'd love to meet with you again. We'll give you the floor.
Dude, if you go back and review but the we, footage we've in the last put it, 20 we've minutes. Put a pin, oh we've put a pin. We've put a pin. We'll put a pin in the <laughs> Trinity passage. Find the Trinity passage in the New Testament, and we'll meet again. Just reach out to the missionaries. But it was nice meeting you with Austin. Seriously? Like gonna... that's... He's got to go. So do I. Okay, but y- you right. just have not given me even two seconds to talk you in the last had, You've had plenty of time, and like you said for us to review this. Um, you, you're, I think you're, anyone who watches this will actually say, like, you're, you've been a fair you're circling. You're circling so much. I, Because from my perspective, you are pulling up sources, cherry-picked sources out of LDS sources to accomplish. I, I know what objectives you're trying to accomplish. I just don't care about them. The point is, is that I'm trying to get to what's the actual concern that you had. And, and it looked like, ask. yeah, and your concern was that there, there, there wasn't really a great apostasy because people believed in Jesus. I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, when you say there's a great apostasy, what, what do you mean in the we sense said, of, we explained it. Yeah, we, we explained went down it. This we went to exa- yeah. exhaustive. I'm not re-asking the question. That was right. me explaining what the question was. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the, I, 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 I'm so sorry that. I don't speak as fast as you would like for me to, okay? It's not even that. Okay. The reason that I go slowly, carefully, point by point, is because I think we can agree that in the conversations that we've had with people of other face, it's an ineffective strategy for everyone involved to list 10 points at once and then later go back and try to you know, rehash each point because you know all of a sudden you're down 18 rabbit trails. The reason that I go slow is so that when we find a point of contention, we try to understand what that point of contention is. It's not because I doubt you guys in terms of your ability to understand the argument. It's so that I don't get lost of where the contention arose. Simply that. So in terms of, you know, your, 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 and I get, you've talked to a lot of guys probably smarter than me, definitely smarter than me, more well-read than me. I get it. And you've heard a lot of arguments time and time again. I get it. But I'm the first time, this first time I'm hearing it from you. And that's why I want to hear what you have to say. You're a guy that should probably do a lot more reading before you start talking to guys like us. And especially when you start asking missionaries who don't know, do more reading. That's why I asked you if you've ever read the Book of Mormon. Read the so, Book of Mormon. Read the Doctrine and Covenants. Like, read them. You're a smart guy. You're studied. You have a master's degree. You have the capacity to learn. And, I, you know, I, I didn't. I haven't learned what I've learned, and Robert didn't learn what he learned from asking people. Okay, so there's no value in me asking you questions. Uh, apparently not. Okay. Well, I mean, if if you find that there's no value in me asking you questions and us having a conversation, then I, I don't really. I guess this would be our. Well, final no, because here's the issue, Austin. When you say, I disagree with the overwhelming academic consensus on a certain issue, and then say, but I've never studied that, and I don't know this, that's, that's a problem. That means that the actual problem we're having is, is there's, an in, there's, a, there's a disparity in knowledge. And when there's such a disparity in knowledge with respect to something like that, unless you close that gap, we can't have productive conversations. I have these all the time where it's like I'm talking to somebody who's never read the Bible and it's like, well, I didn't know it said that. I didn't know it said that. It makes the conversation tedious and almost uh, useless because they're like, I reject everything you say. And I'm like, based on what? Well, based on it's not what I wanted to hear. Okay. And that's a problem. Did you find that that was what I was saying that I didn't want to hear your answer? So I reject it. No, what what I'm hearing is is that I asked you for a specific passage, or as Robert said, a pericope from the New Testament that explains the Trinity. And, and instead, we tried to get this: can we can we agree on certain things that lead us to the conclusion of the Trinity? And the reality okay. of it is, is no, we can't. So, and me trying to understand your point of contestation there is 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 that the argument that I'm formulating there you're saying is an invalid argument yes okay on what grounds it's invalid to sit and say I have presupposed something about the entirety of the biblical text namely that ancient Israel was monotheistic predicated on that I find three gods represented in the New Testament so Trinity 
Okay. So you're saying that there's a presupposition that I have. Right. That that Israel's is monotheistic. Right. And okay. that presupposition is incorrect. And so your position is, is that Israel is not monotheistic in worship? They're clearly not in the text. Okay. They're and, clearly and... not. They're worshiping okay. other gods. They're acknowledging the existence of other gods. Yeah, They're so betraying the god of their nation by worshiping the gods of other nations. How so, could they be monotheistic? Okay, so you're saying that their actions represent that they're trading Yahweh for a different god. That's exactly what they're doing. I agree, they do. And but also that... the biblical authors affirm the ontological existence of better gods. Okay, and that's a very different statement from the one that you were just making, uh, right? They're like, not mutually inc incompatible, incompatible with one another. No, I, I, and I, I would affirm that they're not incompatible. But, but your statement that they're worshiping other gods doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that ontologically these other gods exist and have the no, same kind doesn't. of divinity, divinity as Yahweh, right? No, it doesn't. So and that's me trying to understand: is your position that the Old Testament teaches and prescribes a divinity? to these other gods that are worshipped that is in essence the because same they're, kind of divinity. they're identified in other texts as actually existing and they're identified in other texts as the israelites worshiping them taken together so what robert says was correct and what i said was correct it's both it's both and not either or okay so to, and i hey you know i'm just trying to make sure i'm understanding your position <sighs> is that if I go and I evaluate the new the Old Testament, I will find that the that the Old Testament teaches the simultaneous uh, worship of the Israelites of other gods, as well as the ontological existence of those other gods, and that they are equal in uh, capabilities of divinity as Yahweh. That's an additional qualifier. Okay. Do you disagree with that qualifier? Well, because the perspective on Israel is that their God is the greater God, the better God, the higher God. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that, like, that is their understanding? Like that it's Yahweh? Belief. Okay. My so, God can beat up your God. Yeah. We see that. We see so, that with the contest in Elijah and Kings. Okay. But my God is... can beat up your God. This is, this is my God's land. Get out of here. Yeah, and I, I I'm with you on that, but but are we saying then that the Old Testament's intention is for us to understand that here's eternal Father? The Old Testament and, doesn't have an intention. The individual's authors had purposes in writing. Yeah. So there's no unity in Revelation. I I, I don't understand what you mean by that statement. I know. I know. We we need to stop tonight okay okay so we'll, we'll see you austin you guys have a good night you too mm -hmm.